is Jessica Clement. She is the director of the Collaborative Program in Natural Resources and Research Scientist in Human Dimensions in Natural Resources at the Ruckles House Institute of Wyoming, Institute of University of Wyoming. She is a scientist, practitioner, and teaches in the fields of human dimensions and policy and natural resources. So, welcome. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'm, let me just apologize. I had set aside time to prepare for my talk, and I got waylaid by a dog. Um, it turns out that my dog, Sam, had four broken teeth that were hurting him badly, and all of a sudden surgery was required, so he took up my chunk of time. So I just finished putting this together this morning, but I, um, I am going to tell you what I or originally wanted to tell you, just not quite in as much depth as I wanted to. Um, so we have been talking today a lot about aspen and aspen regeneration, forest then dynamics, beavers, watersheds, all kinds of natural resource issues. And in, very often in the rooms where we work with the public and with each other, there is this thing called climate change that is hanging there in the room. And a lot of us are thinking about it, and a lot of us are trying to find ways of trying to prepare for it, trying to model it, um, and not deny it, not avoid the subject. Some of us are still skeptical, and that can be very healthy. But either way, it is an issue. And a lot of us are trying to find ways to deal with it. Um, but there is one big barrier very often to being able to deal with it, and that is fear. And I wanted to talk with you today about fear and from coming at it more from a social psychological perspective. I found on April 27th, 2013 in the New York Times an article that really helped me think about this and I agreed with this writer Peter, Peter Kellerman who is an earth scientist at Columbia University and he was describing how all of these people are talking about the dire consequences in apocalyptic terms about environmental uh, consequences of climate change and social consequences and economic consequences. And then he says, meanwhile, my children are fearful of and almost paralyzed by the prospect of an inevitable dystopian future. They would like to contribute to avoiding calamity, but they don't see where to start, and they are told it is too late to begin. And my children are lucky in a stable home among the 3%, talented, athletic, well-educated. In the face of an overarching climate of fear, people with less opportunity find there is nothing they can do to help avoid destruction, displacement, and despair. This language, I'm 54, and this language reminded me of my childhood. In my childhood, it was nuclear war. We were scared, I was scared as a kid of nuclear war. And there was bloody nothing I could do about it, was there? There still isn't, by the way. <laughs> but fortunately, um, good things have happened on this planet and we're still here and we get to worry about the next big problem. Meanwhile, our children are feeling this way and it's not just children, most of us actually listen to a radio station or a television station or see a, pro see a program and feel like this. It's a real concern and it's a big barrier. And that, this is what this author is worried about. He says, climate change is a fact, but blaming is unhelpful. He says, you know, and sometimes in our Walt Disney-esque kind of way of thinking, not just in the United States of America and other places too, you know, we want to have someone to, to blame. But at the end of the day, in the real world, you know, stuff happens, move on. 
and he is worried that no constructive action will take place because everyone is so terribly busy being afraid or paralyzed by fear. And he doesn't know how to turn constructive action, he doesn't know how to turn fear into constructive action, and he wound, ended his article saying, we probably need to seek help from social scientists and media. Good luck. So let's look at social science a little bit. And specifically, I want to look at social psychology. So it's the psychology in relation to groups of people. How do groups of people function? What motivates them? What drives their behavior? And I, as I was saying, I was not able to do the, the big highfalutin literature search that I wanted to do. But the amount of time that I had to look at the literature, this is, these are a couple of the highlights that I found. Um, one is that there are various kinds of skepticism out there. Some of it has to do with outright denial that climate change is happening. Some people are denying more in terms of what the effects are going to be. They don't believe that the effects are going to be that bad. And there are various other forms of skepticism, but it is not just one type of skepticism. The other thing is there's very often an automatic assumption that skepticism is automatically based on self-interest, on the so-called rational actor. And that assumption, the literature shows, is not necessarily true. It's a lot more complex than just self-interest. Um, other information, other research shows that values and beliefs determine the orientation toward climate change. I'm going to go into this a little bit more later on. Um, this research also showed that it comes down to personal costs. At the end of the day, we each are going to think about what are we driving, what kind of house do we live in, where do our children go to school, what about our children, what about their children. It gets really personal. Um, the Inconvenient Truth, uh, which was a, an amazing feat, of course, by itself, but it made it about morality. And even though we may buy the argument that Al Gore was making in an inconvenient truth, how do I afford at that personal level that kind of morality? How can I, be, how can I afford to be moral? How can I afford to do the right thing? Again, it comes down to personal costs. Um, then there was another piece of research uh, that showed that they, this was in Australia, and they, they looked at skeptics as a cohort of skeptics, various types of skeptics, and asked them, um, okay, why are you skeptical? And then they took them through the first type of intervention, which was showing them pretty gruesome models of what would happen in the place where they lived in the next 50, 100, 200 years under various climate change models. Um, that changed their opinion somewhat, that softened their opinion somewhat. Then they took them through a three-day forum to really get into climate change information. And that also, that, that softened people even more to some extent, but it also showed that the people who were the outright deniers, really hardline, uh, absolute naysayers, cannot go there with climate change at all, they hardened, their positions hardened. Um, and so they became even more entrenched. So this is all interesting information. Um, then if we get away from, from the social psychological literature and think about media, I'm just going to relate a couple of things that stood out for me. One was um, I was interviewing people in Jackson Hole, Wyoming for a study I was doing. And one day I had to interview a county commissioner. And this county commissioner was not in a very good mood. And he had a magazine, but he had it upside down. So I just saw the back ad. And finally, I, I said to him, you know, do, do you want to do this interview at a different time? And he said, no, I'm, e <coughs> excuse my French, effing pissed because, and then he flops the magazine over, and it shows, I think it was 2007, a Time Magazine cover that has the world up in flames, basically, in the background, and I think the cover story title was something like, 
what the heck are you thinking, or something like that. But it was very confrontive towards people who were skeptical about climate change. And it was obviously straight on pointing a finger at them. And he was angry about this because he said, I don't have any reason to believe any of this information. I don't understand what they're saying. Even if they're right, what the heck am I going to do? He could rattle off a whole list of questions why he didn't feel like he needed to believe anything and why it made him feel disempowered. So basically, what I had in front of me is a man of good sense who was scared, just really scared. So I rather thought that that Time Magazine effort was pretty darn unhelpful. Um, then I also have the memory of Al Gore doing a presentation in Aspen, and Greg, you may remember this. Uh, at the end of his presentation, Al Gore, and maybe he felt safe, you know, in the Republic of Aspen, but he was, he was basically calling anyone who didn't believe what he was saying an inconvenient truth, he was calling them a bird brain. Well, I didn't think that was very helpful either. So that was my second example. And then uh, Peter Kellerman, in his, uh, in his article, talks about his, his worry that, social, that scientists, climatological scientists, other scientists, are very quick to start describing the terrible effects of climate change and use very strong language to use that because it gets them attention and therefore funding. Well, that might be a little too cynical, but there is, I hear his point. But altogether, the whole picture is something that will create fear and it will disempower people. It will, it will just make it impossible for them to move into that kind of action. Just a little psychology that I, that I was thinking of um, is that, you know, climate change has happened before, um, but we didn't, even, we didn't know it was coming, and we didn't even really know it was happening. You know, at, if you look at any time, time scales, there have been massive changes in climate while Homo sapiens was roaming the earth. It, but it just happened. And we, like any other animal, simply adapted, found ways to survive. Um, the other thing is climate change has happened before, but we didn't know it was affecting the whole planet. It was happening in this place, where, wherever we were, whether it was India or England or the United States, or whatever we were called then, if we had a name. You know, it just, it happened in this place. We didn't know it was happening all over the world. We didn't even know there was a world. We didn't know there was, we were on this round ball, you know, spinning around up here. Um, so, in other words, we know so much more. So there is that much more to be afraid of, and there are that many more reasons to feel disempowered. And psychologically, we, our brains, are not adapted to be able to handle things of this magnitude. It's a tall order. It's a big stretch. It is understandable that we are going to feel afraid. Okay, now, let's turn this, let's go into the direction of something more positive. So there we are, we're afraid, fine. In social psychology, there's something called cognitive hierarchy theory. And basically what it says is that at a very rock bottom, we have our values. Values don't change very much. We don't, we're not very good at articulating them. We have them and through the lens of values, if you orient our values towards any subject, we are going to have beliefs about that subject. We are going to have attitudes about this subject, how we feel about things, and then ultimately we are going to behave. Economics is a type of behavior, ultimately. How, if you're studying the world of economy, you're looking at the end of that cognitive hierarchy uh, is the way we spend our money. So if we want to get to action, as Peter Kellerman was talking about in his New York Times article, we first have to understand values, beliefs, and attitudes. We have to understand where people are coming from. The good news is social scientists are all over that. They're working on that all over the world. 
um, basically, we can say there are two main ways of thinking about values. There's values that are more anthropocentric, um, more human-centered, um, that are more, very often more economically oriented, and there is, tends to be a high level of self-interest related to it, measurably. And more anthropocentric value orientations tend to be opposed, more opposed anyway, to climate change related policies. Then there are values on the other side of the scale that are more biocentric. These are more nature centered, there is a higher level of uh, altruism, um, and there's more likely to be favor in, in, there's more likely to be favor for climate change related policies. In between over here, being very anthropocentric, and way over here being very biocentric, there is a realm of possibilities of things that we agree on, things that we care about. And my suggestion is that we find this and talk about this with climate change. If we're going to bring in the science, let's do it in the context of this. What is this? Social science, um, mine and many, many, many others, shows that there are things that we, most of us, care very deeply about. Uh, one is, from a natural resource standpoint, wildlife. I have had the good fortune of doing social science in relation to all the forests in Wyoming, most of which in a forest planning context, and I can tell you that in Wyoming, wildlife is everything. It is absolutely everything. It is why people live there. Um, and if we do things in the context of wildlife, it is going to be a way for people in Wyoming to be able to sit still and listen, because it is an interest that everybody in the room is going to have. We can make it also about children. We all love our children. We are, in a, in a climate change context, concerned about our children. Um, we can make it about landscapes. We are increasingly talking about landscapes and natural resources, which is completely appropriate, and more of us understand that everything is connected and that it is. Talking about a landscape scale makes the most sense if you're worried about mule deer, watersheds, beaver, children, community, you name it. It's all in the context of a landscape, and that makes sense to us. And we make, so we understand the future. We want there to be a future, and we want it to be a good one. So these are just some subjects that is in the middle over there that I would suggest, if we're going to talk, and we have to talk about climate change, we have to. There's no doubt about it. But within these contexts, we, we can make it a context that everybody can care about, or certainly most people, and at least would be willing to listen, even if they are a hardline denier, because they too have kids. Um, the other thing I would suggest is use principles of adult learning theory and systems thinking. Because of the complexity related to climate change and how it challenges our brains in terms of spatially and temporally, and, and effects. Um, because it is so huge, we need to find ways of talking about climate change in a way that allows us not, so not this kind of forum, but a forum where we can talk with each other. Adults need to be able to take in complex information, process it, and then spit out questions and thoughts. Uh, we need to talk about systems thinking, thinking in the large picture. We need to have patience with different levels of fear, acceptance, and denial. So someone is a denier. They need more time. That's all there is to it. Uh, use collaboration. Uh, include transparency. Communication skills are going to be very important for all of us. Equal access to processes. Use collaborative learning techniques. Maybe it's not about immediately creating a solution. Let's just get around tables to start learning. Um, the other thing is, let's stop trying to persuade. Bring in the science, use this context in the middle, and if somebody is not going to be persuaded, leave it. 
It's not going to work. It could actually backfire. And of course, make science more accessible, relevant, and personable. I think this is my last slide. Um, how about avoiding a climate of fear in the West? The West is really tough uh, because, you know, you know that story about there's a big flood and uh, the water is rising and the guy has to go up to the first floor and then a boat floats by while he's in the first floor. Oh, no, first there's a radio announcement saying, okay, the water is going to rise. Then the boat comes. He doesn't want to take the boat because he's very sure that God is going to save him. And then eventually he has to move up to the roof. And then a chopper in the middle of the night wants to take this guy off the roof. But he says, no, 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 leave me because God is going to save me. The waters keep rising. The guy drowns. He goes to heaven. He's at the pearly gates. I, by the way, I got this joke from the, the chair of the theology department in Harvard. So no... No disrespect intended. I feel I can do this. <laughs> um, so, then, so then the guy is standing there at the pearly gates in front of God, and, and, and God is sort of like, yeah. And he says, well, I thought you were going to save me. And God says, I sent you a radio announcement, I sent you a boat, and I got you a chopper. I don't understand why you're here. Here in the West, we have kind of the same thing. We don't have big oceans. We don't have Sandys and Katrinas. It's far more subtle out here in the West. It's droughts. It's fires. But we always have droughts. We always have fires. So it's a lot tougher to recognize here. Um, so again, make it about community. Make it about our communities, our landscapes. Make it about resilience, restoration to serve um, uh, resilience, um, and then get conversations going within the, within the context of wildlife agriculture. Maybe you're not at, in a room, maybe you're a hydrologist and you're talking about watersheds. Talk about climate change in the context of beavers. But don't always make it about climate change. Maybe we can be more subtle about it and bring it in in different ways and different angles so that people can start adjusting to the realities and understand that with your expertise, there are things that they can do. They do have more power. Um, and then the other thing is, on the, other, on the one hand, we don't have any time. We're in a mad rush to deal with this. And yet we have to give us homo sapiens time to process this. The more time we give them, I think, in the long run, the faster they'll be able to come on board and start creating that action. And this is my dog thanking you for not quite getting the presentation I was hoping to give you. <laughs> Any questions? Or any thoughts, or am I naive? Yeah. I sat through this uh, restoring the West uh, in a few sessions in the past, and I never hear anybody talk about overpopulation. <coughs> and that, I think that's one of the things that has to be addressed. I would completely agree with you. Um, about it. Any kind of particular type of overpopulation you're thinking of? Too many people. <laughs> <laughs> I think out here in the West, uh, it's, it's, it's too many people, but that's a global kind of conversation, too. Yeah. No, but I think you're right. Would you comment a little bit on the use of the terms of climate change versus global warming? Um, it's my understanding, and I read this in a book some time ago, I don't, don't even remember the name of the book, but the suggestion was that sometime during the Bush administration, you stop talking about global warming, instead the Bush administration started referring to it as climate change. What is your advice on how we use those terms? Well, I'm not a climatologist, but my understanding is that um, 
climate change may be more accurate. If someone else wants to disagree with me, please do. But um, I think the, the way climate is changing will have different effects in different places. Some places are, are going to be cooler and, uh, or wetter, and other places are going to be warmer and drier. But it's not that necessarily everywhere all over the planet it's going to be warmer and drier. It's not necessarily going to be global warming. Additionally, my understanding is that it, it's, it's likely to go through different phases in different places, where there is first maybe cooling and then warming, or first warming and then cooling. So climate change may actually be more accurate. If you're trying to talk over a very large scale, climate change might be more accurate. That's my understanding. Actually, I was asking about is, what have you learned about how people respond to those two different terms? Should we be avoiding, for example, the use of global warming because of a defensive posture right at the outset? You know, I, th I think if, if someone is going to be defensive, they're going to be defensive no matter what you say, quite honestly. Um, and then at the end of the day, I would say, let's, let's be as accurate as possible. And if in, in, some, in some place it's going to be a warming, talk about warming, but if you're talking about on a, cli on a global level, I would say, I think climate change would be more accurate, so that would be the best way to use it. But at the end of the day, if someone's going to be defensive, it doesn't matter what you say, they're going to be defensive. I'd like to add, one of this morning's speakers had global change. Any comments about that? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's absolutely going to be a global change. Um, I, I like it. Yeah, then when you're moving away from the whole climate thing and just going into global change, I think that's a great idea. Um, but what it does is it kind of avoids the original reason why we're having the global change. And I don't suggest that we ignore that either. So for now, I would suggest climate change. But it depends also, Darren, what context you're talking. Yeah. Just another comment. Uh, recently, there was a poll uh, where people were asked, what, what are you worried about most, Obamacare or affordable health care? And people. Uh, Mostly, we're worried about Obamacare. Is that the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.